Hello, people and webinots. I'm trying to come up with a word to say people who to talk to say people who uh, navigate the internet and participate in world communications through the internet. So I'm trying to think of a word like world world knots <laughs> world knots or internauts internauts kind of cool anyways today I want to talk about the United Nations uh, General Assembly speeches that occurred uh, five or six days ago six or seven days ago I've been watching quite a few of them I think um, this event that occurs every year is a good barometer to kind of see what at least gets summarized and condensed into what may be the general sentiment <coughs> of uh, individual countries and perhaps um, showing a general atmosphere of uh, the spirit of where what the world is thinking about what sorts of things how what the philosophy of politics in a general sense uh, as a collective is start is um, is shaping as or like and um, and you can compare year to year um, and then you can detract a lot of things you can uh, extrapolate a lot of um, things that could describe the state of the world and what the, the, the problems that never get resolved are or what the main pursuits of what people really want what country leaders really want from the rest of the countries um, I don't want to get into something that I like a subject that I like a lot which is the transformation the the reconfiguration the redesign of the United Nations into something that's uh, an organization that is more perfect in its demographic representation and its uh, contribution equal uh, contribution by all countries equal power equal reciprocity um, and a lot of things that actually things that a lot of leaders have already been uh, putting on the table for years already and it gets ignored um, there's a lot of desire by the world to transform the United Nations into something that is uh, truly an identical voice for each country an identical influence by each country and an identical server for each country um, that is not a case of course and uh, in part I don't want to dwell on this but just to summarize or give it give a, a, a quick synopsis and what the reason is, the United Nations was created by the, the powers that uh, won in the, at the end of the World War, uh, World War I and the, um, sort of the, the other powers were invited to be part of their, their club, um, but in a secondary place. And it, as such, it, it is a manifestation of the systems that these countries were uh, uh, you know, uh, influencing and and um, I don't want to say ruling, but were uh, were effectuating their power in the world through their political systems, and so the United Nations itself is uh, constructed and and uh, and ex it's extruded out of the vocabulary, uh, the uh, the systems vocabulary. In other words, the the logic of administration that these countries had so it stands to reason that it is simply an enhanced instrument of uh, for uh, the ways that already these countries were operating in the world that will default to uh, serve them better than anyone else because those are their systems those were the ways through which they were already working and uh, affecting the world, influencing and interacting and um, <coughs> conducting themselves in the world, except that, of course, all these uh, ideals 
were uh, made their front labels to do with equality, to do with uh, peace for the world. So without getting into the analysis of, of why the United Nations may be lopsided and dis, uh, in, in proportional to uh, an equality that would refer to the whole world as equal nations, um, let's just continue, let me just continue from where the United Nations uh, was, I don't want to say, say sold to the world, but was proposed and uh, through this idea all nations were invited on board so either either we, these countries that are leading the United Nations change that, and I, I think in some ways they've been trying to um, or they fess up they own up to what uh, with courage to what they, I, many probably earnestly and sincerely meant would be the proposal of the United Nations and remind us all that it was created for peace to bring, to end wars in the world. This was the central reason for which the United Nations was created to bring peace and to end wars and then of course to uh, to uh, foster and 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 bring well-being and um, you know stop hunger and all these other more specific um, ad, uh, points and goals or agendas uh, but at the center was the idea that the world was tired of having wars too much suffering too many massacres too many genocides right the the, the Holocaust it was like the the um, the protagonist event that uh, seemed to speak the loudest uh, on behalf you know uh, through the purposefulness of countries like England and the United States and France and the the, the Germany that came out of the war and um, but in reality, the United Nations, although one might think sometimes that it seems to be for Israel, and it's either against or for Israel, it's all about Israel sometimes it seems. In reality, Israel was not the purpose of the United Nations. Um, the United Nations was created for an equal protagonization of all countries, and the, equal, the equality of all nations for the purpose, the aim of peace for the world, for all countries, for the planet, to end wars on the planet, among all nations, not just in the Middle East. Um, okay, so huh, this said, this reminded, this put back at the center of the, the, the purpose, the reason the United Nations was created. Um, I am thinking about the the speech Maduro made um, was very powerful. I think he probably started s slipping or oozing out things that um, not that he should feel more account his country should feel more accountable for, but uh, start becoming too highly. Uh, uh, pr processed in 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 in, in, a, in, a, in a too deep of an analysis. Uh, I mean, his immigration, the problem, the immigration problem, and even the uh, American representative kind of you know, looked to the side, looked at his uh, his colleague, and um, it seemed pretty preposterous. Uh, it seems preposterous to for Venezuela to think that it's flight of people have to do with the United States. A lot of other things were very powerful, you know, it can be worked, can be looked at, can be analyzed, but the first thing that comes to mind is that, um, you know, people are leaving because they don't like what's happening to the country that you're running. 
you know, that problem you can't really uh, pin and hang on the United States so much. I know where he was coming from. I kind of feel that he was trying to get to something deeper. He, what he was trying to get to, which, you know, the time that you have to do these speeches would never be enough to explain, to fully explain these more conceptual and deeper uh, understandings, po social political understandings that he was alluding to, which is um, the strife, the toil that comes about dealing with the United States through so many decades, in some cases results in obvious uh, uh, fl fleeing of wars, migratory, you could, for example, be easier to uh, blame the United States or the or, or NATO or Russia um, or Iran on, on the Im, uh, Im, uh, refugee crisis in for Syria, but to blame the United States is a little more difficult because you, the South American, the Latin American relationship in this sense with the United States pertaining to the same problem is very different. It's old. It's two hundred years old. Um, like he, he was saying, um, and there's a lot of expectation on, on, there's a lot of disappointment on behalf of, of, of Latin America's, um, South American nations, Latin American nations, um, about the United States because there's, it's just a, a real psycho, social psychological 200 year old subject to do with positions that arose after the colonial era. Uh, relative, relative perspectives to each of these two hemispheres, north and south, uh, about each other, and it's you can't really compare it to Syria and the Middle East. Uh, but I kind of understand why he feels the United States was accountable. But anyways, I don't, um, I didn't want to focus on Maduro's speech. I wanted to actually focus on something else that made me realize something and it is uh, something else that happened uh, some days later which is the ruling by the Aya court I'm, actually I don't know how I've been hearing it so much in Spanish that I don't know how it's pronounced in English the the court of the Hague the Hague the Hague International Court of Justice um, ruled in favor of, uh, not in favor, it kind of, yeah, more or less, generally, without running over the details of this, uh, in favor of Chile, regarding their, Bolivia's claim of a uh, exit to the, to the, to the Pacific, um, coast, <laughs> uh, a sovereign coastline that it used to have, uh, was part of Bolivia, nobody is arguing that, it, if you look at an old map, you see Bolivia comes with a little arm that comes out to uh, the Pacific with Bolivian cities and then something happened and uh, there was a war and as a result of the war uh, Chile uh, decided that the Chile one uh, helped to some degree somehow very indirectly you know very at a distance by England of course uh, against Peru and Bolivia and um, they, that whole long piece that uh, is taller than Argentina that goes along the Pacific coast uh, used to be most of it part of Peru. Peru actually dipped all the way down and Bolivia had a leg that came all the way under Peru and Chile was started lower than today's highest part of Argentina. So that whole long stretch was acquired from Bolivia and Peru as a war trophy, basically, for um, declaring for going to war with Bolivia and Peru, both of them. So um, the general atmosphere, the general political atmosphere, and the social social network atmosphere was that it was it's so audacious and so recent so fresh in history that there were uh, that this was part of Bolivia and that um, Chile started doing business um, sending people to run what were they guano you know 
Kernel Farms and there was Salt or something before. Um, and eventually uh, there were agreements and the Chileans felt that the Bolivians didn't respect the agreement. Well, in any case, Chile decides that they're strong enough to go to war over this. There wasn't a previous claim that they wanted to uh, fight for. It was just an opportunistic war because Bolivia was always, it was not really kind of like what Bolivia is still in, in, in relative to the rest of South America. It wasn't so strong. Peru was a lot stronger, but Chile won this war. And they probably knew they were going to go to, like most wars, countries want to have wars when they know that they can win and they're going to win. And when they have a, a sure enough sense that they're going to win, the other one usually uh, is more filled with passion and an optimistic uh, sense of righteousness. Uh, but wars are usually started by that country that more truly understands that they're going to win. Um, and so in any case, it was a little unexpected to see the ruling by the the Hague, the Hague or the Hague. Uh, anyways, I really, d I, I, you know, when I talk about these things, I, I don't uh, do my homework. I don't prepare myself. Um, I understand things very generally, very conceptually, and I think that uh, the fundamental base understanding uh, upon which things are built are clearly enough understood by me to make a discussion about it and above that everything else everything that's built on that can be shifted can be rearranged in all the details that it possesses that's how I, I, I do my, my thinking my reasoning uh, so th it's not a high risk kind of uh, discourse it's a very conceptual discourse, but, you know, at the base of everything that the world is, there is a conceptual, very uh, fundamental base of that is set in how things arose and what they were built on and how they happened. That can be talked about, you know. Um, and so, for example, thinking of the United Nations and thinking about this decision by the International Court of Justice. The United Nations was created for peace. Now this is the problem I have in, um, in believing that the United Nations as it is running can be an instrument to bring about peace and not an instrument that installs and fixes down the feasibility or the working of war. In other words, it seems that the United Nations works more towards organizing and installing war to function a certain way rather than to truly rid the world of war. And the reason I say this is because Wars are started when something, something gives, something snaps. You know, they're, they're trying to go forward, they're trying to work things out, they, they, they put up with this, they put up with that, they went too far here and it caused something else and, and people are talking and all of a sudden something snaps, something, something, someone, somewhere decides this is a reason to just go to war because rules and agreement and sensibility is not working anymore we just have to use force to to what to settle this that snapped in other words war is caused by that which uh, provoked a snap what made which made things give right yet we see that after something snaps and gives and is the reason for which war occurs countries walk away with trophies, land trophies. They take home Gibraltar. They take home part of the, the Pacific coast of Bolivia. They take home things that are now called their territories, their colonies, their new land. Um, this seems to be uh, a common practice amongst countries. Uh, and I ignore I'm, I'm very audacious, I realize that. I, I, I can't reference things specifically, but I can venture 
to say things. For example, the the war that broke out between um, Mexico and the United States. Being American, I still I know a few things. Like I can say Alamo and, and sound like I know something, but in reality, I can't precisely give dates and names and events that were the trigger, the cause for uh, the respective armies to go at each other. I apologize to my country for this. But I can be fairly certain that all the territory that the United States ended up taking from Mexico is, very, is, a, is, a, is a far cry from what the reasons for the war happening were about. And such are practically all wars. I don't think, I don't know of any war, there might be, I would love people to get in. Uh, I'm going to start sounding like all the other YouTubers and say, leave your comments, tell me what you think below and all that stuff. Um, wars that, that, is, that you know, um, triggered, that blew, and then they said, okay, so now we, we've settled that problem, let's all go back home. And that, we won't argue about that anymore. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Um, and yet that is the reason why war, wars occur. So I'm thinking, the United Nations is meant to end wars. It means it would be an instrument to intercede where two countries are arguing over something they won't stop uh, entrenching themselves in their respective sides and are about to go to war or have gone to war over it and say, stop, what are you fighting about? What is, what is going on, says the United Nations? Well, okay, let me decide since you can, I, mean, I have a cool head, I can process all of human history and, and this big brain that I have and what is fair is that, you know, you do this, this, and that. Uh -huh, you weren't thinking of that, huh? Well, see how it works out for you too? And you do this, this, and that, and that will be good for you too. Both are happy, win-win, no war, United Nations resolve the situation. That should be the role of the United Nations. What does the United Nations do? it looks at the treaty of in this case i'm guessing i'm not sure what happened at the international court of justice on the first the four, the first is when they the first of, of uh, october is when they gave the result where they favored chile on that dispute but i know by reading around and listening and watching and hearing people speak that there was a treaty in 1904 uh, where, you know, Bolivia said, fine, you know, take, take it, you know, don't stop beating us up, right? I'm sure it was the case, you know, stop like, we're, you know, you, you look like you won't stop, and now you're going to, you're going to want to take, invade our capitals, maybe if we just let you have the, the coast, you won't completely destroy us, and you know, it sounds like I'm trying to be comical, but this is the tragedy of the world, war is used to abuse one another. They, if they are started because we know we can abuse the weaker, the smaller, the less prepared, we can win. Once we're, once we're at war and we look like, it looks like we're winning, we in, uh, on the go, you know, in flight, we decide to now, since we're, this is brewing in a victorious way for us, let's also kick him over there, see if we can get away with, with this and that. And so they're taking advantage of. So um, I don't think Bolivia wanted to uh, felt good about or felt fair about relinquishing their exit to their their maritime sovereignty uh, over a war or to Chile. I'm sure they felt lousy about it. In fact, this is proven by um, countries continue countries continue to say that Gibraltar is ours, the exit to uh, to the Pacific is ours, the Malvinas are ours, you know, it's because no matter what happened, we still feel wrong about it. So where is the United Nations to bring the justice that countries can't create? Instead, what the, between themselves, instead what it does is it, it seems that it looked at this agreement of 1904 and said, well, we're going to honor this treaty where you accepted defeat and 
we're going to call that the most the the strongest deciding factor in our judgment and this seems to be what the international court of justice did now if this is the philosophy you know let's try to take all the, the strongest most coherent legal structures of of law of international law that that exist and treat which involves treaties and agreements um, really what it seems to be doing it seems to be um, helping helping systems created by victors by the countries that were able to dictate treaties that were uh, in, in, in belligerent situations of, of uh, treaties that were born out of belligerent environments that's not um, getting rid of war in the world that's basically helping the world continue to be a war a world that is more formally and more comprehensively administrated by wars and when you think that the United Nations actually sends peacekeeping troops its instruments its tools are those are of war instead of saying uh, you know we we have no invested interest in this we are nothing but intelligence and reasoning and total neutrality so we offer a voice of reasoning of thinking of political philosophy of political um, uh, views that are not influenced or pulled or constructed by neither of you guys we look at the world and as such all countries are defect are defective all countries have problems all countries will tend to be abusive if they have enough power and money and military we know what any country the monster any country could be even Grenada Guatemala and some in the poorest of African nations uh, given enough money and a few decades of, of developing them, themselves in, in power will be the monsters that many people are, con are calling Iran the United States Russia China um, you know we know countries for what makes them and what creates them so we can neutrally decide if the United Nations were in that mind what would happen well what would happen is that we would try to first of all heal back all the spoils and trophies of wars because the result of a war should not be more abuse and take it because we're the winners that should not be the result of war the result of war should be fix the problems that you were having but you know let's each go back to our most whole and um, integral uh, sovereign form for each nation that was involved in whatever uh, altercation or conflict there was before it's it, it shouldn't be that the United Nations and the International Court of Justice should not be an instrument to help um, to help um, these countries that have developed more prowess who have actually created a lot of the international language and in, 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 uh, uh, international law continue to because they're already good at the using they're already good at using international law. They're, they're the ones that actually said, let's use this system. It works for us. You know, this is how it can work for you. But really, we wanted to you to believe that it can work for you because we're really good at making it work for us. That's closer to the reality of, of how the United Nations is set up today. And as such, it's a club of the, the 20 most this, the 7 most that. You know, it's all about these countries that are configuring to the configuring to the original creators of systems of administration and logic of administration by their inventors, which of course the inventor himself is always going to be better at using his own invention. I mean, come on. So the United Nations should be completely uh, started from scratch. Should be we should all all the countries should sit around all two hundred and four of us 
should sit around a ra big round table and we say, let's all you know, propose a system for this. Let's all propose a system for that. And freedom, you know, and then you will start having countries that think back at their culture 2,000 years ago and how they used to do something uh, 2,000 years ago when Europe wasn't even around. Uh, and they propose that. And, you know, and then, okay, this is, well, let's tackle this. Now let's tackle that and build a new United Nations that, that rises from the completely even input of all people, all languages, languages, languages. The equality of languages is very important too. Through language, language is the, the flow, it's the highway of information, of communication, of thought, of thinking, of reasoning of everything that is said and understood that goes through the language. So if one language is very, uh, has a, a broad and, uh, amount, uh, a, a large amount of volume of information and other languages are kind of like, wait, can we translate our language too? You know, <laughs> what's gonna happen? Only one people's mind is the one that's going to create the world. And that is kind of, um, self-destructive actually it's like saying um, all the cats of the world instead of there being all these different cats species large cats small cats kittens lions saber-tooth you know each one occupying a sector of the ecology and each the whole family of animals coming together for things that have to do with the feline species and if an immunity that is needed by one cat is not produced before a disease it may be that another cat another species transmits their antigen to the smaller species uh, because they already were exposed in some evolutionary past to that disease and so they're able to transmit so nature created our variety and wisdom if we monoculture mono language the world it's kind of akin to what we already understand is monoculturing where all of a sudden one bug will come and wipe the whole thing out because we only have this one type of corn it is kind of stupid for humanity to think that we have to have one one rule everything and we may already know that and the great thinkers and leaders of the world may already realize that we're going to be a tiny little world like this it only squeaks and and you know can't jump higher than that if we only become one culture or one language and yet we will be a, a universe of constantly exploding new worlds possibilities never ending if we continue to be a world of many languages or many cultures and this kind of goes against what i believe that we we should have create a, a global language, but let's put that aside for now. Um, completely different, different discourse altogether. Uh, not the way we're going about it now, put it that way. The way we're going about it now would probably prescribe that any old language would do to be that one world language. And that is not what one world language the idea is uh, is about the idea of a global language is about again all nations sitting around a table and um, designing bringing the best of everything phonetics grammar versatility vocabulary uh, studies on what it does to people to to speak with so many pronouns to uh, use adjectives to modulate different parts of grammar this way you know lots of studies in an, on an equal plane and develop uh, you know, uh, the development of Esperanto would be a tiny little push like that compared to the idea of designing a global language by all nations together as a world project so but since that probably won't happen for a, a few hundred years you, know, you never know in a hundred years we may be the world may have gotten something 30 years from now and, and you would children that are being born today might say you know if in a, if I had been able to understand that as a 20 year old when I was born I never would have thought the world what is what it is today and when they turn when they just turned 60 or something 
Uh, so it, one never knows. What is important is that we understand that in order to get the maximum, the maximum approaches and maximum uh, number of perspectives in order to understand things, in order to unblock things and get them from sides and from angles that one language, one mentality, one political thinking, one stream of thought could never do by itself. We need another people, another language, another scientific development to come from this other direction completely and approach that same problem to say, you guys never saw that. We need these, you guys never saw that. Lots of those in order for the world to be able to be alive and, and changing. And uh, How do you say it when something um, genesis from within itself? It self-generating, you know, fusion, you know, fusion when it continues to like uh, um, nuclear, uh, like a chain reaction. That's what life is. If you look at the, at the, um, what do you call those little patterns that now computers can make? That um, types of drawings that have little forms, and they they're starting to make software that seems to invent patterns as nature would invent patterns and they seem to explode from within more designs and more forms. Well, that um, aspect of the world's evolution would be completely killed by us thinking that we need, we can, we're okay with having only one view, one social view, one social view is kind of a bordering on abstract one but a uh, political view or language use. We need to sit back and let everybody speak and accept, basically. That's what the world has to do. L find the truth that you did not have, that you realize you could not have come up with, that you never thought of in another country. All countries sit back around the round table and listen to each other and instead of competing and seeing where somebody's wrong and letting our egos blunt the progress and the advance of everybody else, we do the opposite. We sit back and we are happy and looking forward to see what somebody else reasons completely different than we ever saw before somebody do. We'll discover that that was capable in each, each country, each language, each, each culture, but we never let them. We never were looking for it, we never wanted to hear it, and we always blocked it when they did do that. So that, that, that should, that's what the spirit of the, the uh, United Transformation or reconfiguration of the United Nations should, should, be about, should be like in that environment of, in that spirit of, of, um, of really wanting to do something amongst all of us together and equally not ruling it <laughs> rule you know what country do you think of when i don't know i can't remember. i'm gonna turn into a jerk now all of a sudden uh anyways so that was it uh i think i'm very disappointed um to conclude that the international court of justice feels that it has to uh maintain the structure that war serves itself of because pe countries go to war against because they see it works because they see treaties and then they have peace agreements where they 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 confine the other country more and so war works for many countries particularly one country comes to mind that seems to have made an art of war they have ethics and they have rules and they have peace agreements and everything just works for it doesn't it it just works so beautifully for it doesn't it and all the other countries have to, okay, yeah, well, you know, you got us with the money, you got us with the bank, we can't do anything else, we got to just say yes. You know, it's this dolling down of, of, of the great ego, this dolling of itself down of the great ego that it must exercise upon others, other countries, what it is doing for this country is actually allowing for women to open the door to others, to all the other countries. <laughs> Come on, these guys are just, they're lost because, you know, men, the thing is, men like 
you know, beating another, you know, winning over another guy. You know what happens to men when they win too many times over others? They start getting lost. They don't know anymore why they exist. Because really, the, the highest leading force of males is that of unity, is that of joining with others. Except that this country <laughs> that I was alluding to feels that it's doing that. It's having others join it in greater organizations. Except that it doesn't lead with that. What it leads with is the um, submit, having them submit, the submission, the conform to, or do it, or else. These are the rules. This is how you qualify to be in this group and this arrangement and this club. And so the lead is actually oppression. It is not connecting. Because connecting is actually being open to what I was saying before. Listening and expecting the unexpected. Hoping to find a rise in the other what is novel, what you never would have come up with, that adds and makes the whole grow. Uh, this country that wants to lead and rule thinks that it's being uh, a leader, that it's being very generous in the far-reaching scope of its, of its systems. But in reality, what it does first is it puts a little finger like my dad, you know? You know always like, he was doing great letting me drive his car. He was so wonderful. He was letting me drive his car. He was trusting me. I was taking him to the hospital. But he would always blow it when he would just take out his little finger that way. No, oh, Dad, I want to take that other street. There's all these trees. You're going to like it. Let me take you down the other street. Yeah, yeah. You know, he had to take out his little finger, and he was not content enough if I didn't take the street that he wanted me to take. He ruined it all. So don't ruin it all, you know? Give, this is what the pure sense of give. Let these people have their islands. D they say it's their islands. Are you, you know, if so, these people react. You say, their islands, see, he thinks that it belongs to them. They don't belong to us, they belong to us. He thinks it will give. Let people fulfill themselves. Are you not fulfilled enough? Have you not done enough? Must you still not let countries fully be satisfied? Okay, let, wait for countries to say, okay, this is good. I finally, I feel satisfied now. You can tell when a country surpasses their fulfillment and starts wanting too much. Don't make wanting too much an excuse of judgment and therefore fictitious, not real. There are countries that have been saying, no, this is what we are, and maybe they went a little too far. But, uh, you know, at, after a point where a country says, no matter what you say, we're always going to want to dominate and always want to be more correct than you, and we are not going to let you have anything you ask for, countries also stop caring about being sensible and mo modest or moderate. What I think is that the country that I'm thinking of possibly could relinquish a claim that goes all the way to the east if we can just work on a generous agreement on a more localized group of islands and everybody gets something, everybody, you know, but the thing is it seems that this country that has always caused so many problems around the world doesn't know how to say, okay, fair enough. The person that has, I think if you find, I don't, know, I don't want to get philosophical now about, it's going to start becoming about capitalism and other things, but what I find is that the happiest that wealthy families, not the most ecstatically 
happy because they're so wealthy. But the families that are truly wealthy within, they're truly full, they're full and they're comfortable financially, but most importantly, they're full within. Their family, they're, everybody's healthy and they do things for each other. They're wealthy in a deeper way. Are the families that knew how to say, we don't need that. Bef before it became something that, um, you know, that they did for logistic reasons or to appear a certain way. Yeah, well, you know, this country is just the trouble. You know, I, I always start laying into this country, and, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just, you know what I think is a shame? I think that the creators of the world, probably God, our creators, however you, you want to understand that, or the creator of the history of the world, which could be mankind itself, has like taken, given, taken, given, had countries take turns at having the power, the power. You know that they were the ones that least, the least other countries would mess with. That had the most uh, free reign. Uh, or, or most proliferous power and influence, or what have you. But it seems that the world has, if you look at history, uh, many countries have been taking turns to occupy that space. And then there were others that were to its sides, you know. And what is a truly shame, what is truly a shame, is that Everybody says when if if it was me and I was in that position, if I had all that money, you know what I would do? I would feed the hungry. I would, you know, give the homeless a roof uh, over their heads. And then it happens. You win the lottery. Boom! You find yourself with several thousand dollars. And you know, even at that moment, there's so much else that was that you f you felt all along you needed to catch up with that mattered to you more but you weren't aware of them when you were feeling so lofty and righteously noble uh, that you forgot about and this seems to be the problem with human nature now countries don't have an excuse because this is what I always think about and the irony that great irony is that when you have a fight with a friend and you actually abused him, you stole something when he wasn't home, or uh, you told something to a friend or to his wife or what have you that you weren't supposed to tell him. It was a secret between them. You wronged, you know, your friend. And the moment comes when he suspects it or finds out or he faces you, he confronts you with what you did. And it seems that what is hardest, what comes easiest is to deny it. That's what everybody does. But what comes truly the hardest to people, to human nature, is to trust that there was something there that is worth putting, depositing your courage into saying yes in the deepest of ways, the most vulnerable of ways, saying, yes, I, I, I did it. I was the one that stole from you. you. Maybe you shocked the person. Maybe they didn't suspect it. It requires a way of saying it. requires the appropriate time. It requires a sensitivity to knowing when the, uh, your friend will be receptive because maybe you do the most noble thing and you said it when he didn't really care all that much and it turned out that it gets used a different way. Anyways, these situations between people which are so difficult and yet we understand the great value and the virtue that, that happens in these moments are the most difficult and yet they are easy to understand. It would seem that in theory you can talk about it, you can prescribe or you can teach your kids to be a certain way. Um, 
when it comes to countries, it's as easy as pressing a button because you write down, were we to ever, as a law, if we ever take a piece of land from another country and da 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 and establish da da da, then or we think whatever we say, we write into law that we give, we in, we will take twenty years and re, can, re, uh, restoring that back. You know, things that would be difficult to do between people. Returning money that was stolen from the treasury. <laughs> uh, corruption. Whatever it may be that has to do with uh, a large mechanism that is misused by human nature. is easy to fix. It's, e it's easy to, um, to design a country. And as such, countries would find it easy to do the right thing for one another because it doesn't have that instant moral difficulty in the, in the, in the heart that person-to-person -person situation re has us, requires so much courage of us to, to wield and be able to do. Uh, besides the moral sight, uh, capacity to see it, to understand, to know how to feel and process the reward. Because it has a reward, it does. It, it's very difficult, but once you get to the other side, you, you, s you finally say, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I said I'm sorry. Whew, boy, that was close. I almost did what most people do, which is to say, fuck it, all that didn't matter. Any Oops, I said a bad word in my video. <laughs> it came out. Oh, no. Okay. Um... Countries should find it easy. Countries uh, can just write it. <laughs> Nobody has to feel <laughs> the you know, fantasy. I, I want to. I want. I'm going to see if I can finish this before it, it becomes more than an hour. I had another thought earlier. Um, I wasn't going to include it in this about the United Nations and the International Court of Justice. But um, the uh, event that happened the other day between Chile and Bolivia, <sighs> I forgot it. I can't remember. Let me see. Let me pause. See if I can remember it before the hour is up. Okay, I can't remember it. I can't remember it. I guess I will. Uh, hopefully, it will. I will uh, for the next video. So summarizing, um, countries need to be more honest since they can be more honest. It doesn't require the difficulty of moral courage that a person would have to muster up to say, yeah, I kept your car after I beat you up because I was angry at you and I, wanted, I always wanted your car and I, I abused the fact that you owed me money to keep your car and I didn't care how much it meant to you and to your kids and how much your kid loved that new Camaro but I, you know, I'm sorry I was a rat and you're, you've always been my good friend <laughs> to be an actor right? I'm a terrible actor <laughs> in any case it's um, that situation would be very difficult right? to, to truly <laughs> to truly make ourselves grind through and do the right thing. Uh, but with the creation of countries, we should easily be honest and say, yeah, Gibraltar was a war trophy. You know, we knew that you didn't want to fight anymore. It was costing you, it was going to damage, hurt your country a lot. So we said, hey, this is our big chance to keep that piece of land. Let's take it, you know, and then they'll it looks like they're willing to bargain it. Yes, sir, but they might regret it a hundred years from now, even. Yeah, it's too late. Let's take it now before they change their mind. These things could be expected of countries' behavior in writing, and it wouldn't require us the difficulty of grinding to the high road of morality and the courage that it needs to... Um, 
you know it's as easy as sitting down at your desk and just writing down this is the world that we want this is what how this is how the world would work well this is how countries would all prolifer pro, pro, um, progress and thrive and everything can be calculated we have enough oil we have enough this we have enough that you know for us to be more than well you know once we stop bugging this country with all this other stuff they should be able to start using that stuff and be more sensible about it there's a lot of um, lying and a lot of superficial sl slanderous character defamation 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 uh, horrible prejudice going on I mean you, you read you read how people talk on on the internet and and you hear people talk about other people's other countries people like like they were you know um, you know things that you can caricatures that you can laugh at or put down as if they weren't also people who are also uh, we don't see equality all these things have to be we don't see the equality of, of human of, of the human heart in each individual that populates that nation equally to the heart in each individual that populates this nation we talk about the other country as they were just cut out figures while we are real people <laughs> but you know this is a, a not a problem of countries I, I'm not picking on any country when I say this this seems to be one of the shortcomings of human reasoning when it, it's too, so easy to just look at the world and see countries like little painted areas and then say the people there and so it's a limitation of human nature but thank God for education. With education, we can teach each other to love better. In fact, l better, higher, greater, more sensitive, more profound, more wise, more intelligent love is taught, is learned. If all we are intaking through our senses is what we're intaking right now, that's what we will become and that's how we'll, we will look so easily as we do at another individual at somebody else by the values and the superficiality that we're taking in uh, by the medium the medias and the ways that we're taking it in right now so education is fundamental to more realistically seeing because seeing another country as an equal is the highest form of realism nothing could be more realistic than knowing that a country's greatness is as great for somebody in another country as it is for ourselves the greatness that they feel for their own nation is as great as the greatness we believe our country is about in reality our countries are equal countries already are equal we are the ones that belittle them with what the, well, the way we teach each other to talk about them but uh, and if you understand that then a lot of the discussion happening at the United Nations uh, the the protests happening right now uh, will start becoming will start becoming more uh, it will start making sense um, you know when Mr. Netanyahu speaks you know every time I hear him speak I hear this man that, that was educated in American college and he seems to use this sort of frat room almost frat kind of what do you call it frat room no frat whatever um, kind of lingo it looks like he's got his beer right next to him you know he should be right next to Kavanaugh and he uses this <laughs> he uses this to appeal politically he uses it politically and he dominates the attention of the United Nations with his 
very fluent English and and very um, colloquial English very informal sounding English very American sounding English he knows that there's a lot of political power in that and uh, I don't think anybody talks about this but I know he is aware of it <laughs> I know that he uses it politically and when you hear him talk you know um, and then you hear you know first it was only certain Arab countries now you have also Latin American, Latin American countries and everybody is like pissed off at Israel and and other um, you know the uh, Haley I'm so bad with names that our representative there's a couple of personalities at the United Nations that are really fighting to support uh, um, to have America support Israel and and you see this in Africa Africa, Latin America, the Middle East. At what point is Mr. Netanyahu going to say, well, let's see what they may be right about. Let's see what the one thing that maybe we weren't doing right. Just one. Just one thing that we have been abusive and wrong about. One thing that they are right about. And I did not want to acknowledge before. Just one. What could it be? You know, there has to be. There has to be if all these different parts of the world are agreeing. Um, so the United Nations is failing. And the United Nations should not be an instrument to have countries who are good at effectuating its power, its influence, its uh, capacities to further wield their will, their desires, their objectives, their their wishes, their principles, even if they are, even if they were all convinced they are the best way the world should go. Let's just say that they really, really wholeheartedly, only wholeheartedly believe all of that is good for the good of the world, and nobody else sees it. They're all dumb and stupid. But we do. So let's just say that that's true. It still would lead to wrong because of what I explained before. The single reality of humanity is expressed by the even plane of all its languages, all its people, all its cultures in their identically equal right to stand and live and come to live in this world. So if one person in Indonesia says humanity exists so that it is as equally it is equally as important as somebody in Germany standing and saying humanity exists on the world so that which is as equally important as somebody in Uruguay standing and saying humanity exists on the world so that this is fundamental for uh, for the United Nations to work it cannot be a competition it cannot be a power play let you know take your power games to your own countries stop contaminating the United Nations with power play the only, the only thing these people are doing and and you know, maybe they're not recognizing what I'm. What I mean, what I mean by other people are as these groups, these diverging, these different groups, the, the Middle Easterns, the Africans, the South Americans, who are starting to all be on the side of the Palestine people. The only thing they're doing, maybe they're not. They're maybe they may have hypocrisy in what they say, just as much as we, as America or Israel or the Russians may be hypocritical in something in about the way or in some places with what they're saying but the only thing they're doing basically if you generalize and look at the whole picture is they're basically saying you guys are being abusive you guys they're not saying Israel is the problem of the world that's only the the Jews and the Israelis and them that say that they're accusing us of being 
you know, they want to kill us, they want to get rid of us, they say that we're the trouble of them. They're actually just saying, enough, this is, there is, this is un unjust, you're being abusive, and these people are being abused. That's what you synthesize, that's what, that's what comes out in the end, in the wash, is that these people, you guys are, have, too, have too much power and are abusing these people that cannot defend themselves. They could become, they could be more sophisticated. They could say, what irony. They could actually pinpoint a lot of things that, but the way it's being, you know, like debates, these presentations, uh, these uh, speeches by world leaders at the General Assembly, this last, they have been, they have been for some time already, um, what ends up looking like a competition of who is more right. <laughs> what? <laughs> this is what the United Nations has come to? A place where people say, look, we actually are more righteous and are more victims than you guys and we have been battered and we are trying to do the and we're actually great and then the other ones well the people that have been protesting uh, the palace the occupation the, the occupied territories are basically trying to protect people in the name of disproportionate imbalance and abuse by another country but they're not attacking Israel. And this is another thing that um, I found really interesting that I just mean, remind me. You know, the triangulation it, it, that is happening in the argument between Iran, Israel, and the Palestinian cause is blinding people from seeing the, the dynamics of the situation. Because while Israel is saying that Iran is evil because evil ha uh, because Iran has said at some point Israel is a problem and death to Israel and blah blah blah, what is not being said is that the Iranians say that sourced by, caused and provoked originally because of the abuse on the Palestinian people. And then they made it become the problem is Israel because, because they're the ones attacking the Palestinians. So these triangulations that um, sort of block us from seeing the, the actual development or how things are occurring are happening in a lot of places. It's happening, for example, on the Falklands, where Malvinas, where uh, Argentina says the islands were taken from their own sovereign right in 1833, and the British, instead of arguing that, say, we are defending the Falklanders, the islanders, against the Argentinians who want to have their land different completely different things and so what should be getting talked about which is was Britain right in using force to eject Argentina in 1833 because the island should have belonged to them or did Argentina actually had Argentina already acquired some sovereign right to the islands by that point should they be arguing over it should they uh, you know and to this situation came the islanders later to this situation the the British population was brought to the islands later and so now Britain jumps over the original conflict and starts making it about a country being aggressive against the people on an archipelago on the islanders and so what does the world hear the world hears another country being aggressive towards a people and it's not happenstance I mean this is actually 
part of logistic communications and miseducating the world. So if the United Nations cannot rise above miseducation, uh, changing what the world is exposed to insofar as information regarding a specific conflict, and it cannot rise above um, rules, inter laws, laws, international laws that have to do with war agreements and peace agreements uh, that cater to the countries that best pull the strings of war and most prowess have developed in war and the thereof creation of agreements and laws and diffuse the whole machinery uh, that maintains, that continues to produce what gives sus sustenance to war and what continues to um, frame it in, in, a, in, a, in a working format, in a working matrix. And it can't uh, objectively look above these things and diffuse and, and this undo these two things, just to name two objective views that could be had by a would-be United Nations, the United Nations we have today is pointless. It's basically an instrument for those who best know how to use it against other countries for what little it can do or for what it can do where it can do. But it's not uh, aiding the world or helping the, war, the world or uh, ending wars in the world. It's not. It's just formalizing wars in the world the way it's working right now. Thanks for the extra 10 minutes. And I hope somebody watched this. So long. Have a good night.